Well, hello everybody. I'm Claire and welcome to my video blog. Okay, well, um, we have a situation here now in Europe, in France in particular, um, an absolutely dreadful uh, thing has been perpetrated in Nice. Um, I'm sure all my uh, viewers are well aware of what happened. Um, I shan't go into the details of it. Obviously, a crazy Muslim guy has... Um, well, uh, maybe he's not so crazy. This is what I want to talk about. Um, uh, Ploughed a huge truck into a crowd of people and killed 80-something people and dozens of people dismembered. It's absolutely unbelievable, except uh, it does seem to have happened. Now, what I want to talk about is the fact that um, we have all the, uh, what is now becoming a stock reaction, you know, hashtags, um, uh, Facebook flag um, avatars. Um, we must all stand together, whatever that means. Um, and of course, uh, the one that crowns them all, well, Islam is a religion of peace and they're not all like that. So, I've been looking at this um, for some time now and um, I, I think that this is the time, I did mention it in a previous uh, video I did on probably, I think it was the one about Brexit and Turkey. Well, Turkey's uh, up at the moment as well, but I won't talk about that particularly today. Um, but I did promise to do something about Islam, and now seems to be the appropriate time. Right, so... This is not what Muslims are like, right? Okay, this is it. Um, and uh, only some are like this. It's a radical interpretation of Islam, and um, really it's a religion of peace. Well, it's interesting. I used to believe that the word Islam meant peace, I don't know where I got it from. Um, uh, I think I assumed it was associated with the word salam, which is uh, Arabic for, sh uh, for peace, I believe. The Arabic version of shalom, which is the um, Jewish term. And, um, well, anyway, I've discovered more recently that it means actually submission. Um, and... We have um, Arabic scholars saying things like um, the nature of Islam. Okay, this is a this is um, not just me making this up. There's a um, there's an Arabic scholar by the name of Hassan Al Barna says the nature of Islam is to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its law and power to the whole planet. So this is actually what I want to talk about. Now, the material that I'm going to um, give an overview of today is um, drawn primarily from, um, more recently, some lectures I've seen by uh, an expert on the subject, Stephen Coglin. Um, and I'll be referencing his lectures below where you can go and watch them to get the full chapter and verse, literally, and uh, detail. Um, but I'll be going into some of this uh, points that he raises in his extremely detailed and comprehensive lecture series on the subject of uh, Islam and terrorism. And uh, my other source is um, Dr. Bill Warner, who uh, is a retired professor of quantum physics, so um, I, I think he's probably up to the intellectual task of this, and he has um, uh, both a website called politicalislam.com and a YouTube channel of the same name, Political Islam, and uh, I've watched quite a few of his videos, um, short ones, long ones, interviews, and um, there's a tremendous amount here, and one of the things that Stephen Coglin raises is that this material is um, in the public domain. Um, it's not only available in uh, original Arabic which makes it obscure to Westerners. There are English translations of um, books um, on Islamic law and uh, interpretation of the Quran, and um, these are available in English 
and um, they are used by um, such organisations as uh, the Islamic Brotherhood. And um, it's all... Uh, one of the things I think is extremely interesting is the um, fact that our Western governments um, seem apparently completely oblivious to these facts. Now, this is um, something Stephen Coughlin mentions, um, because basically either the leaders of our country, and I think we know that Theresa May, for instance, in this country, um, has shown um, excessive compliance towards Islam. Um, but either they understand this, what I'm going to explain, or else they're ignorant. Now, if they're ignorant, they shouldn't be. Uh, if they're ignorant, it'll be because they have trusted people who are compliant and submissive to Islam in their reports on this. So if, for instance, Theresa May said to Sadiq Khan, Mr Khan, you as someone who is a probably not very devout um, Muslim, but nonetheless nominally so, um, in the way that many Westerners are nominally Christians, um, he would probably say, oh yes, uh, Islam's a religion of peace, blah 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 blah, nothing to worry about, carry on. And so she said, oh well, thank you Sadgit, um, I'll just carry on and we'll just say let's have lots of lovely more Muslims in this country. However, this is one of the fundamental tenets about um, Islam, um, which is that um, th there's a, they have a, a practice, a way of uh, dealing with things called taqiyya. And what taqiyya means is to give a misleading impression to people who are non-Muslims. So uh, they want to... Um, they want uh, non-Muslims to believe that uh, Islam is a religion of peace, that um, they're all very obedient, good citizens and all this sort of stuff. But what they give the misleading impression about is the fact that there are more advanced stages and Islam is a very complicated system of thought. Um, and it's all geared towards what I read on this uh, previous page, which I'll read again, that um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the nature of Islam is to dominate, not to be dominated, right? And uh, uh, to extend, uh, sorry, impose its law and power to the whole planet. Now, there are various um, the, the, um, aspects of this, but the first one I'll get into is what's known as the Hijra or the Hijira, um, and that is the uh, diaspora, the colonization of non-Islamic countries by Muslims. Um, this is based on uh, what it means is uh, the, the word Hijra actually comes from the uh, same word uh, that was used to uh, describe the flight of uh, Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. And this is very interesting because, um, and there's a great deal more detail about this in the Stephen Coughlin lectures, and Bill Warren has written books about this. Um, but I'll just give a kind of overview about this to get the insight into the, the way this works, right? So, Muhammad was teaching his, um, what you might call soft Islam, um, teachings in uh, Mecca. And um, he wasn't getting very far. Um, there were a lot of uh, kind of, you know, um, quite kind of ruthless brigands and, and um, all sorts of people who just weren't interested in his kind of lovey-dovey message. Right. So anyway, he kind of flipped, basically, and then there's the flight to Medina, which is the Hidra, and then he went to Medina and he got a bit wound up and he decided, I've had enough of this. So um, he started teaching the more aggressive, warlike Islamic teachings. Um, now, in the, in the Quran, these are kind of mixed up. So whereas in... 
both the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, they're pretty much chronological. Um, the, the Old Testament um, has the prophets at the end of it, but they're, they're ordered in size, I believe. Um, but up before that, all the way through from Genesis to Judges and Kings and all those, um, they're all pretty much chronological. Same in the New Testament, obviously you have the four different accounts of the life of Jesus and the Acts of the Apostles, which is what takes place after Jesus dies and all that. And then uh, there's the Epistle and then there's the final book of Revelation. So, so we in the West are conditioned to this view of, right, well, it's all kind of chronological and it's all kind of revealed in, you know, various stages. And so um, even uh, um, what there's, a, there's an aspect of Christianity which um, Islam exploits, which I shall explain in a moment. But um, the Quran is not a linear account. There's various things jumbled up and mixed up. And um, that is one of the points. I don't know whether it's deliberate. It could well be. Um, but the point that I was going to say that uh, they exploit off from Christianity. Now, obviously, one of the big things about Christianity is that um, Jesus is supposed to have come to uh, release humanity from uh, the, you know, kind of uh, unforgiving wrath of his father and, you know, the sacrifice, you know, made, made you know, um, salvation available to all humanity and all that. Um, and so we have this idea of, of the, the law, the moral law being changed, being updated, right? Now, um, what happens in Islam is they say, oh yeah, well, first you had the, the, you know, the Jewish thing, and then Jesus came and changed all that, so, you know, Jesus is all kind of, you know, love and forgiveness and all that. Um, and then, you know, I say, well, what's, what's wrong with that? That, that, Muslim, that Islam, under Muhammad, has to come and do this thing whereby suddenly it's like, well, I, I can kind of see how this works for them. So what they say is, oh yeah, well that was just a temporary uh, kind of dispensation, you know, from God. But now we've got the ultimate final one, you know, like Muhammad, um, you know, replaces Jesus. Or the way they res you know, respect Jesus as a lesser person to, than Muhammad. But uh, Muhammad the one, is the one who's got the mojo, you know. And of course he has all this, um, this tremendous amount of warlike stuff. Uh, in uh, the uh, Quran, I'll just quote, um, well, I'll just mention um, uh, chapter 8, verse 12. I, I think that's Surah 8 of um, the Quran. Anyway, I've seen this one several times, and it involves um, striking off the um, fingertips of the unbelievers and um, terrorizing them in the name of Allah. So this pretty much sums up where the later form of the Islamic teaching goes. So what they, the way this works is they have this thing called abrogation, right? So they introduce people to the softer, more um, um, teachings that would be more amenable, say, to a Christian um, when they say things like, there should be no compulsion in religion. Oh, well, that sounds all right, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a, yeah, well, we can accept somebody who says, oh, well, you know. But the thing is, that is part of the earlier teachings, which um, were then abrogated at a later stage when uh, replaced. That's what abrogation means, to replace. Um, and when he went to Medina and entered the more warlike phase, where he started making these warlike utterances of striking the fingers of the enemy and all that, then this is supposed to replace the earlier teachings, right? So the way that I can only see that, well, this fits in with the takia thing, because the takia is to give a false impression. So basically, what it seems to me to be is that the earlier softer teachings, which are intermingled and confused with the later teachings, they actually lure people in. So you might almost say that, that, that Christianity is a kind of softening up exercise for Islam to come along. Because the Christians are all, you know, but forgiving and open. That's kind of pretty much where Europe is at the moment. Um, 
because we may not be, uh, you know, ostensibly uh, as Christian as we were in former centuries, obviously we have the legacy of the, um, the cultural and ethical um, standards which you know, obviously have, have evolved over a thousand years and more of Christianity. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, universalist um, ethics of Christianity fails to uh, take account, or at least the modern version, I mean the, the medieval version of Christianity, understood there were things outside of Christendom. And um, I, I, just as an aside, uh, what comes to my mind about this is that I think that, uh, while well, not being, not calling myself a Christian anymore, although I did in the past, I think there's, there's an interesting thing here that um, Jesus might have said that it's good to die for your fellows, but did he, and he might have said it's good to forgive your enemies, but I'm not sure that he actually said it's good to die for your enemies, because this is what um, we have, basically, we seem to have a situation now where, you know, um, people are saying, oh, what, you know, what was it, was it Trudeau who said, um, if you kill them, they win. Right, so, uh, you know, Islamic terrorists are killing people, and we're winning. I don't think we are. Um, but anyway, so I'll get back, anyway, I'll get back to the Hijra, right? So the point is, it's a, that, um, what this has come to mean is the colonisation, right? So... They, the whole idea about Islam is to model on the life of Muhammad, right? So Muhammad started off a peaceful guy in Mecca, moves to Medina, turns into a warlike kind of guy and um, takes the jihad from shortly after that. Now, so what, what, is, what is taught in Islam is that there is nothing greater than to perform a hijra. Right. So what the idea behind that is to go and leave your own country, leave your own people, go to a foreign country, settle in, settle down, be a good citizen, and then, in time, increase your numbers. And this is the taqiyah. You tell everybody Islam is religion of peace and all this. But the taqiyah, the deception, the giving of a false impression, a misleading impression, is not to let on that you've come there to perform jihad while you are in mecca this is the this is the, the the kind of analogy they use back while you're in mecca which was where you started from you were a peaceful person more abiding blah 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 but you perform the hijra you go to the new place and you perform jihad to take over mecca to for to carry out war on the world because it is their system of belief that the whole world should be brought under the sway of Islam and to uh, confess that their God, Allah, whatever that means, is uh, the only true God. And that's a whole other thing in its own right. But so what we basically, so what I've been trying to explain about this is that people say, oh, it's not all Muslims and Islam is really a religion of peace. Now, Islam being a religion of peace is the taqiyya. It's the surface. It's the image that you give when you, you, you go on your hijra. You go to um, uh, the foreign country. You act like you're a you know, law-abiding citizen. But actually, you're preparing for the jihad. right? And we all know that... Um, every army does not have its entire, every nation does not have its entire population on the front line. You know, we've just obviously been much memory of the Somme recently. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Um, and there were millions, there were millions in the trenches on both sides. And yet, of course, there were even millions more back home in England, in Lancashire, in Yorkshire, all the Birmingham, all the places where they're making war and all that, all the war material, and the same in Germany, and millions of people doing in themselves perfectly peaceful things, except what they were doing was supporting 
supporting the war effort and that's exactly what the jihad is just because you only have one or two people doing atrocities like this doesn't mean that there aren't many people supporting them behind the scenes and uh, I may have mentioned this previously but it's worth a second mention is after the Bataclan incident of which there's been new information coming out recently um, the ringleader um, by the name of Abdeslam went to uh, um, Belgium and hid in uh, Molenbeek, I believe it was, where he was openly um, known who he was and um, he wasn't given up because the other, obviously, generally law-abiding citizens of uh, Molenbeek just didn't report him. They all um, were good Muslims, apparently, who, uh, um, you know, put their own faith and their own law above that of Europe. And um, they um, they didn't give him up. And then he was eventually arrested, and that was thought to be the trigger for the uh, Brussels uh, the airport or railway bomb. Anyway, the Brussels bombings a few days afterwards. But the point which doesn't seem to have been picked up quite so much by the mainstream media is the fact that Abdeslam had a brother, well he had two brothers actually, but one of them had been living in Molenbeek for over ten years. And for the last ten years, the Molenbeek brother had been working in migrant resettlement for the Molenbeek Municipal Council. Right? The brother of the terrorist who organised the Bataclan massacre, however many people it was, I've lost count, his brother, right, the brother of the ringleader of the Bataclan, right, had been working for ten years resettling migrants in Molenbeek, where his brother came to stay and was able to openly walk the streets with people knowing who he was because they were all Muslims who had been resettled by his brother over the last ten years. Um, and I'll just, I'll just um, add one last thing here, which is that um, in Islam, Sharia is considered Islamic law, Sharia law, which is derived from the uh, Quran and the um, traditions, Hadith, and then um, scholarly interpretations, but they kind of come down in that order. And in Iraq um, and Afghanistan, where new constitutions have been put up, the West don't understand that Sharia is considered to override the constitution because when they talk about human rights, when a Muslim person talks about human rights, when an Islamic country talks about human rights, they're talking about, to them, Human rights is Sharia law. So whereas we may think about human rights as being, um, you know, equality between men and women before the law, um, uh, being tried by your peers, um, reasonable doubt and evidence, all that kind of stuff that we take for granted here in the West. No. If a country accepts that, if a country is Islamic, they consider the law of Islam is that it overrides the civil law. So this is what this is what's growing in 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 the West. Um, so really, what we have here is a situation where we are being completely misled. The people at the top, such as Theresa May and Obama, well I think Obama must know more because he has more of a background with Islam. These people are either completely stupid um, or they're completely just not paying attention and believing what Islamic advisers tell them because uh, Obama seems to have quite a lot of people. Clinton has somebody 
who's a Muslim, I believe, who uh, is her personal assistant. There's an awful amount of Islamic infiltration into the American government, and uh, quite a lot in this country as well. And when you factor in the idea of Takia and Hijra, uh, it becomes quite clear that this is basically designed to take over our countries. So there's so much more I could say, and I hope I haven't left any of these points dangling, but there's quite a few, so I've tried to kind of um, pull them all together to explain why it is that Islam is making a serious attempt on taking over the West. You have to remember that it's been making war on Europe since the 7th century, right? Um, it expelled Europeans from the north of Africa, a few left over, Circassians, Berbers, and then it expelled the Eastern Empire from what is now Turkey. They took Constantinople, the greatest city of the ancient world. Um, they continually predated upon the coast of Italy. Back in the 8th century, Charles Martel gallantly defeated them and expelled them from France, but they occupied Spain for another, I remember, is it seven, eight, nine hundred years, something like that, until um, Ferdinand and Isabella finally pushed them out. And so we have both the ideology, which I've tried to give a brief introduction to, and we also have the history, which is the empirical evidence of the expression of that ideology. So, when somebody says, oh, well, not all Muslims are like that, well, this is absolutely perfectly true, and um, they may be perfectly decent people, but the point is, if that's the case, then they are probably unconscious of the greater scheme of Islam, just like many people of nominally Christian don't properly understand the theology. This is probably the same with many Muslims. The point is, it's not the Muslims, it's the Islam. And the Muslims, they just fall in behind it. So, I'm going to uh, put the uh, links for the uh, Stephen Coglin and um, uh, Bill Warner um, information below. And I would urge you very strongly to uh, spend a bit of time looking at this material, because... It's absolutely quite astonishing that the leaders of the West who roll out these platitudes about Islam being a religion of peace have as much or a great deal more access to this kind of information than you or I do just using the um, open source material available on the internet. So you'll have to come to your own conclusions about why it is that what should be standard security information, which MI5, MI6, should be feeding to the politicians to say, look, this stuff is dangerous. You don't want to have them in this country. There may be plenty of, you know, compliant peaceful Muslims, but they are part of the pillars that are holding it all up, so that the ones at the top, the commandos, they can't do it without the support. So, please look at the videos, Stephen Coglin, Bill Warner, excellent material, and um, thank you for watching, and I'll be back soon with something else. Thank you very much. Well, Islam is a religion of peace, and they're not all like that. So, I've been looking at this um, for some time now, and um, I, I think that this is the time, I did mention it in a previous uh, video, did on probably, I think it was the one about Brexit and Turkey. Well, Turkey's uh, up at the moment as well, but I won't talk about that particularly today. Um... But I did promise to do something about Islam, and now seems to be the appropriate time. Right, so... 
this is not what Muslims are like, right? Okay, this is it. Um, and uh, only some are like this. It's a radical interpretation of Islam, and um, really it's a religion of peace. Well, it's interesting. I used to believe that the word Islam meant peace. I don't know where I got it from. Um, uh, I think I assumed it was associated with the word salam, which is uh, Arabic for, sh uh, for peace, I believe. The Arabic version of shalom, which is the um, Jewish term. And, um, well, anyway, I've discovered more recently that it means actually submission. Um, and we um, uh, ploughed a huge truck into a crowd of people and killed 80-something people and dozens of people dismembered. It's absolutely unbelievable, except uh, it does seem to have happened. Now, what I want to talk about is the fact that um, we have all the, uh, what is now becoming a stock reaction, you know, hashtags, um, uh, Facebook flag um, avatars. Um, we must all stand together, whatever that means. Um, and of course, uh, the one that crowns them all, well, oh, hello everybody. I'm Claire and welcome to my video blog. Okay, well, um, we have a situation here now in Europe, in France in particular. Um, an absolutely dreadful uh, thing has been perpetrated in Nice. Um, I'm sure all my uh, viewers are well aware of what happened. Um, I shan't go into the details of it, obviously a crazy Muslim guy has, um, well maybe he's not so crazy, this is what I want to talk about. We have um, Arabic scholars saying things like, um, the nature of Islam, okay this is, a, this is um, not just me making this up, there's a um, there's an Arabic scholar by the name of Hassan Albana says the nature of Islam is to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its law and power to the whole planet. So this is actually what I want to talk about. Now, the material that I'm going to um, give an overview of today is um, drawn primarily from um, more recently some lectures I've seen by... Uh,